Okay, students, uh, this lecture is about um, the crow. I have a few other lectures in there as well that are short and brief, and you have to look at me instead of the comics. So I refilmed this one uh, for you this year. Um, all right, so uh, one thing you have to realize as you read through this book is there's a whole lot of things going on, okay? This is a love letter to someone you know, who, who is dead, essentially. So it's, it's a way, you know, as the author, you know, you really should watch the interview with James O'Barr. I mean, he tells you this is a catharsis. That's how he dealt with a real death, death in his life. So, you know, you've got all those themes of anger and pain and loss and, you know, romance and love and, you know, all that good romantic type of stuff, okay? Also, because this was written during the 80s and 90s, you have the goth punk rock influence to this as well. And gothic, you know, which is heavily influenced by gothic literature, which is why our lead character, Eric Draven, is almost vampiric or vampire-like. Um, and which is why, you know, it, it has some of the conventions of gothic literature. Um, you know, for instance, we have elements of the supernatural. Uh, it is, in fact, a ghost story. Um, so, you know, you know, think like Frankenstein, you know, think Dracula, you know, that's Gothic literature, uh, often has themes of violence, predation, love, loss, religion, um, oftentimes, you know, has a main character, he or she that overcomes evil by their own innate qualities of goodness or morality. And it's going to have supernatural in it. Oftentimes the setting is in a haunted mansion or, or something like that, or a castle. Now, uh, we don't exactly have that, but you have the Draven's house, which is, in fact, a, you know, mansion. So, also notice there are film noir characteristics. Uh, film noir is, uh, you know, essentially an attachment on it, but it's essentially black film. You know, we, we have uh, the truth of the story that's not revealed until much later. That is the rape and murder of uh, Shelley and the uh, murder of Eric Draven here. Uh, we have, you know, the cityscape, which is almost like a character which seeks to devour everyone uh, and convert them, you know, over to its sin. Everybody is sinful and everybody's involved in crime and takes place in back alleys and seedy bars. You know, those are some of the characteristics. And you also have uh, extreme black shadows and extreme... Uh, you know, light, where things are, are lit up very brightly. Think um, Blade, the original Blade Runner. Maybe Blade Runner 2049 a little bit, kind of, but also the Maltese Falcon, which is, you know, old movie. But these are the kind of movies we're talking about here, especially the, you know, the, the original Blade Runner is really a modern sci-fi film noir. Um, you also have a main character who is usually deeply flawed because he stands out from everyone else in his own morality. Uh, oftentimes is an alcoholic or drug user. So we got a lot of boxes we check here. Also, I want you to notice the uh, the role that music, lyrics, poetry, uh, literary allusions, uh, you know, references to bands and songs, you know, they all kind of set the aesthetic for this comic book. And that's something that can be researched to talk about how that aesthetic, this dark goth, you know, pain and romance and love and tortured soul type stuff is established through the poetry and the the music, but I want, and the lyrics and the you know references to Shakespeare. There's all kinds of stuff all throughout this, and you know I don't really have time to stop and go over each one. I mean, you know, you have Google, you can look these things up if you're interested, but a lot of them are you know uh, you know famous poets like Rimbaud and Voltaire and Shakespeare and some lesser known poets from like the 70s. Uh, and also uh, a lot of song, a lot of music from the late '80s, early '90s. You know, especially the '80s, like Joy Division. Um, you know, The Cure. Um, you know, uh, Peter Murphy. You know, Robert Smith's The Cure. Peter Murphy, the the God of God, the the father of the goth movement. Uh, Iggy Pop. You know, these are the characters that. This uh, Eric Draven is based upon, okay? Also, another theme that runs through this is the idea of yin and yang, duality, you know, uh, good and evil, black and white. Um, everybody has both within them, you know. Um, we see two different versions of people. 
We have Eric Draven before the murder, Eric Draven after the murder, Eric Draven as the crow, the uh, you know this instrument of vengeance. He has one eye that's dead and one eye that is uh, still alive, blue. Uh, represents his two sides, you know, the killer and the lover, the killer and the forgiver. Um, Shelly is Shelly, and then you have Corpse Bride Shelly. You know, there's a lot of themes of duality in here and two-sidedness. And um, in Fun Boy, and it can also be used compared to um, Eric Draven as well. So look for these elements as, uh, you know, we flip through here. You can see, you know, the dark and light that I'm talking about with film noir right on the first inner page. You know, there's the use of shadows. All right. This uh, here is worth reading from uh, James O'Barr. He explains that this edition comes 20 years later, and he got some perspective on his life and some ideas changed. Um, so mainly what he's added is a bunch of kind of romantic memories with Shelley, but one significant thing is he adds a new horse scene at the end, and it completely changes the meaning of the first horse scene, and uh, we'll talk about that in just a little bit, because uh, James Abar completely changed uh, his outlook on things, so it affected the comic book. All right. This, all this is worth reading, and I really wish you would, uh, because it really explains some things, especially the history of crows in the back. Is worth reading. All right, so you can already see here this kind of goth rock, femme, kind of feminine male, you know, hairband type thing of the 80s uh, that we had here um, with the leather pants and all that stuff and the makeup and the, the, the you know, the, the 80s metal band hair. Uh, but what I want you to notice is the barbed wire is something that repeats itself throughout the comic book and represents the pain and suffering that is behind every single part. Okay, we have our first couple of poems here, written by James O'Barr. He has no formal art training, no formal poetry training, but I think he's pretty good. But I just wanted to point out, for example, you know, when you think about how these poems function, they foreshadow some things that are to come, like the top one is the whole rape scene that won't be revealed till later, a film noir characteristic. But they also lay the aesthetic, the tone, the mood for what's to come. They're also the name of the chapters. All right. So we have our first punk here. If you notice, you can see the film noir qualities, the, the alleyway, the city as a, as a character. Um, you got kind of a creepy ghost type thing, gothic element coming out here with the uh, tricycle rolling forward and a kind of, you know, like the ghost vibe, like you expect some little... Ghost girl to go, la, 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 come play with me. Uh, and instead, we get our David Bowie-looking uh, vampire with a uh, the panel skew. Notice there's black in the background in the gutters. And anytime you see something askew and horror, you know, it's, it's to build that scary, something's off type vibe. Um, you can see his two different colored eyes. All right, and you notice they're in the moonlight, or specifically, he refers to it as moonlight, but it's actually uh, a lamplight in a city, and that's going to be a reoccurring image that has to do with the rape and the murder, kind of building on this insanity idea that, you know, you, you get when, when uh, you, you lose someone. Now, this is probably the most straightforward the dialogue's going to be for the whole comic book, because our main character mainly speaks in poetry for the rest. But just to give you an idea of how you can break down these things, um, you know, one, we see uh, the dialogue, are there spots in a leopard's eyes also, which you may be saying, well, what the hell does that mean? And so you have to think of this like poetry, and you kind of have to de decode it because he speaks in poetry. And you should be getting the reference to, uh, you know, um, uh Leopards have spots, yeah, and that should make you jump to the idea, can a leopard change his spots or nature? You know, the idea that a leopard is a killer. And then, but why does he say spots in the eyes? Okay, eyes are the window to the soul. That's where, you know, you look to see if people are lying, telling the truth. Um, so in other words, can a leopard change his soul, the spots on his soul? Eric Draven is holding his left shoulder, but he was stabbed in the right. Left shoulder, why? You ask yourself why. Anytime you do analysis, ask yourself why. 
Because that is a shoulder that hurts when you have a heart attack. We have the idea of pain, suffering, you know, loss, love, heart attack. Um, ordinary Nocturne there on the right side of the page by Rimbaud. Again, has to do with death and the afterlife. And so many of these poems have to do with pain and loss and love and death. Um, so, you know, you can analyze them or look up analysis of them and, you know, write an entire essay on how they fit in. Okay, Shattered in the Head here is the first horse scene I'm talking about. And I think when James O'Barr first wrote this, and the way I first interpreted it, was that the horse is Shelly. Eric Draven makes eye contact with the horse, you know, the first time he met Shelly. They fall in love. And because of this, the horse runs into the barbed wire and uh, dies a horrible death. So, you know, he feels guilty for this. Trains in literature often mean change or crossing over to something new. All right, notice the back panels. Uh, you know, the, the, the foreground panels are over the top of the back art, which is, again, suggesting artistically that this pain is under the surface of everything. Okay, um, we have the crow first appear, and the crow is an interesting uh, animal to analyze. Um, you know, if you read the history of the crows in the back, you know that crows, you know, predate uh, the Christian God and the old gods that existed even before the Celts, uh, before uh, the Christian God had been combined together through a number of Middle Eastern gods like Elohim and Tetranomagon and um, you know, several others, L. Um, but the crow existed far beyond that, before that, in a uh, female uh, form, and then later in males, uh, later associated with the god time, death, uh, the Vikings, it was fate. Odin had two of them. Uh, but, uh, you know, Apollo is associated with crows. It has, always has to do with time and fate and death and destiny. But there's a question here is, you know, what you know what exactly is the crow because there's at times when there's a lot of christian references throughout the book so you know is this some kind of old god is this another manifestation of the christian god uh, the jewish god that comes to humans in the form of other you know talking things uh, other angels is this an angel sent from god uh, we have a cat gabriel in here we have a lot of crucifixes you know so this is an interesting idea for students to you know, play around and toy with. Um, okay, at the end of the book, we're going to find out that horse scene has a completely different meaning. So again, poetry setting the mood. Again, film noir in the background. You know, the city is a landscape. These are real places in Detroit. All right, we have a murder here uh, again, but what's significant is the narration, who we assume to either be the crow, Eric Draven, or a combination of both, if they're somehow, you know, in some ways connected as a shared entity, whatever the, the idea is, um, knows things about individuals and where they're going to be in ways that's not quite possible. That, again, reinforces the idea of fate. Um, you see on the right panel, again, that film noir look, you know, our hero in the in the trench coat there. And you're really going to want to start analyzing, you know, this dialogue if you're interested in that for an essay because, um, you know, there's so much religious reference in the way he talks. All right, also uh, the art here. Notice we have a combination of different types of panels. We go from predominantly dark to predominantly light. That's the way the whole comic's set up. Memories involving the pure and innocent Shelley and their relationship back then are always going to be bright white with some grays. <coughs> and the current misery that they're in is all going to be in dark. Now, a lot of students have compared uh, Eric Draven to kind of an inversion of Christ, which means uh, essentially they're the same, but in many ways the opposite. <coughs> so... It's interesting as you look through this comic book that Eric Draven is was killed against his will. He didn't choose to be sacrificed and was brought back to life against his will and goes around dispensing death and not forgiveness, uh, whereas uh, Jesus was uh, brought back, you know, in, in Christian religion, was brought back for a 
was you know he willingly allowed himself to be sacrificed and uh, to to forgive to forgive sinners, not to dispense with with justice, and was again resurrected uh, uh, by will, we assume uh, or we're told. Um, okay, so a little comparisons there. Okay, there's that bar wire that reasserts itself in the back of everything. He is literally the ghost in the haunted mansion here. There's the court bride, corpse bride. Okay, and you can see the way that poetry is used to express itself here in this in this column book. We see a first glimpse up at the top left of the night that the murder happened. All right, so here we have our one of our uh, guys that's responsible uh, being killed. If you'll notice, um, there's you know reference to Hamlet on the left. There's all kinds of references to song lyrics and stuff like that if you Google these quotes. And again, we have a reference to that moonlight from the night of the rape, you know, in this lone solitary light. And I'd like to point out that all of the killers, if you'll notice, try to bribe or buy their way out of um, their fate. And uh, except for Fun Boy and uh, T-Bird at the end. And this, this is significant because, uh, you know, Fun Boy is a whole different character. We'll get to that when we get there. All right. I always found that top right to be a funny uh, example of moment-to-moment -moment closure because, you know, he's been shot, his legs are up in the air, and then the next moment they drop down, creates kind of a dark, humorous effect. Uh, notice the blood spatter looks like crows, and notice we have a reference to a band uh, down there on the bottom right-hand center page. And also more evidence that uh, Eric Draven is supernatural, that good and light side of her, of him. You know, um, he's undead. He just killed a bunch of people, but, you know, he's nice to the lady and has a magic army of cats. Yay. I want an army of cats. Cats supposedly can see um, spirits. Uh, so, again, here in these blurred areas, uh, we have, you know, Shelly dancing. This is the dance that Eric Draven will uh, imitate. Uh, later, and uh, these uh, warm, soft curves and fuzzy images like this uh, all are associated with fond memories of the past. Um, and then now we have the present comparison up there, the corpse bride versus Shelley as she was. Uh, more poems, uh, I believe Baudelaire, uh, that again have to do with, you know, death and the afterlife, pain and loss. And that cat is Gabriel, the cat that was with the woman that got shot. Uh, also notice that Gabriel is one of uh, God's angels that dispenses uh, his wrath and kills a bunch of humans uh, in the couple times of the Bible. Um, so, you know, important reference there. More poetry to set the tone. You see, again, the city as a character. Real place there. You know, film noir qualities. Again, that fond memory of the past. And this is where uh, the past memories start to kind of blur in the hallucinatory type of thing with Eric Draven's present reality. And if you'll notice the, I don't know if that's a reflection of a window or a cross in the crow's, you know, eye, but you could argue maybe more religious iconography there. All right. There's that poem from the beginning. Okay, here's imitating the dance. You have another, you know, a lot of times there's some kind of irreverent references to Christianity here, and it makes sense because, you know, what James O'Barr said in the interview about being angry with God, if God even exists. So you still see that, um, that, that kind of um, religious cynicism and at times, or confusion, or pain, and anguish, anger, whatever. Uh, we have the light again, like the moon. Okay. Now, this Gideon's pawn shop scene was a little better, I think, in the movie. Uh, but again, Gideon's been making his living off of, um, you know, the pain and suffering of other people buying uh, jewelry from these murderers. Um, this scene is significant as well, because we see that flip side to Eric Draven, who uh, somehow psychically, beyond just what a, a, a pale place on a finger represents with a wedding ring being taken off, 
in a tan line, but uh, he seems to he seems to know that these two you know need to get back together. Seems to know more than that just implies. And keep in mind that Eric Draven is uh, you know he's a master of the pain of loss. If anybody knows about you know losing a good love or relationship, you know it's him. And so he um, kind of has this power, almost like a vampire over this guy, you know, and and convinces him to get back together with his wife. And later on, you'll meet the, um, the kind of abused street kid, uh, Sherry, and it's implied that this cop and his wife are back together and take her in. Uh, but a significant scene there in terms of the two sides of Eric Draven. Um, we know, we have more evidence now that Eric Draven is in fact dead um, because <clears throat> that's his homicide file there. Um, generally not a mistake police make. So more poems. You know, again, setting the mood. The irony that the crow lives on. The irony of celebrating, you know, Christmas in August. Um, this on the left here is uh, a translation that says, Where the Snows of Yesteryear. It's from a famous song about memories and things that happened in the past and lost. But you see here again the, guy, the um, film noir cityscape swallowing up all innocence like this little girl Sherry you find is in a horrible situation that pains me to even think about even though it's made up. Now Sherry is only two letters off from Shelley. Sherry's also the only other, you know, main blonde we see uh, in here that Eric Draven gives his engagement ring to. Uh, kind of, and there's no romantic angle here, of course. You know, this is simply, you know, he sees an innocence in her, like an innocence that was in, you know, his uh, fiance uh, Shelly, and he's trying to save this little girl because he, he couldn't save Shelly. There's no, you know, weird, creepy sex stuff going on or anything like that. Um, you know, uh, although sometimes students, you know, ask about that because um, later on the cat in the hat is on the floor of Sherry's bedroom here and Shelly had this cat in the hat uh, thing they did romantically with like a hat over her, her, her private. So sometimes students ask about that, but I see no evidence of any kind of creepy stuff going on. All right. That's, you know, her mom. Um, and we get to see Fun Boy here. Now, Fun Boy is an extremely important character because James O'Barr uh, is essentially expressing uh, what could have been him and what he kind of was like in Fun Boy. You know, according to the interview, he went through a period of emptiness and hollowness and, and worked as a mechanic, would come home and um, do a lot of self-destructive behaviors and, and eventually saved himself by creating this character, The Crow, which is also based on him. So it's interesting. This is almost like two choices that James O'Barr could have been. This hollow, empty thing, fun boy who, you know, again, you have that, that poem irony because the irony is fun boy is not very fun. You know, he's an addict. He seeks to fill the loneliness, the emptiness, the hole inside himself with drugs and mistreatment of women in a vulnerable state, with murder, with rape. And is empty like a serial killer. And serial killers will tell you that the that emptiness they have is the most horrible torture of all. Worse than anything you can imagine. Worse than even pain. And they kill because that's the only time they feel things. Um, so he's going to be used to be compared to Eric Draven. Um, so keep a close eye on that dialogue. Because there's significant things said. A lot of literary references that you would have to look up if you want to get everything. And notice that his choice of drug is morphine, uh, which, you know, is a painkiller uh, related to heroin. And on the previous page, the crow is telling Eric Draven uh, what drug the guy is using as if he psychically knows. Uh, again, keep in mind, Odin had two ravens who circled the world every day and whispered him uh, the secrets. Okay, another memory there. Okay, now this page is really significant. Uh, in terms of the religious symbolism. You have on the top left the house, the holy place of spirituality and love that is Eric Draven's home. On the right, you have a church, you know, the holy spiritual place of, uh, you know, Christianity. 
On the left, you have Eric Draven and his instrument of um, divine religion, spirituality, justice. Uh, you know, it looks like a Mini-14 semi-automatic rifle. And on the right, you have that big, tall crucifix that Catholics often carry. Bottom left, Browning automatic shotgun. Bottom right, crucifix. Top left, um, you know, again, another religious tool of Eric Draven's. Um, for dispending, you know, his uh, justice, spirituality. Uh, Fun Boys symbol painted in blood. We also know that the cat in the hat is going to be up there and a couple other things. <clears throat> and on the right, it's compared to, you know, religious instruments like candles, you know, um, that the Catholic Church uses. I forget what they're called. Pentecostal candles? I can't remember. But they also have religious iconography on them. You have the church, right, where the living go. And then you have the cemetery, another holy ground where the dead go. <clears throat> and then you have some interesting dialogue or narration in here about the idea of the the, the vicious being vengeful, uh, you know, or or less paradoxical than God. Uh, basically, the idea that, that that both evil and God, you know, kill people indiscriminately, um, and that there's a paradox in that. It's worth analyzing and thinking about philosophically if, if you're going to analyze the writing of this comic book. All right. So here we have an example of Eric Draven and more religious iconography holding his arms out like Christ on the cross. Um, we have it again on the next page here. Okay. And then we have this conversation with Fun Boy. Now, Fun Boy is interesting uh, because Fun Boy, you know, doesn't feel anything. And we'll, we'll come back. We'll circle around to that later in his death scene. All right, that's the cat in the hat scene I was talking about there. Okay, so here's, uh, you know, the event, that, the instigating event that happened. Uh, you can see these themes of fate and destiny in the top left as the crow first appears blurry in the background. That's also going to be the way he leaves the book. And we also see the Thunderbird with, you know, almost like a crow symbol on the front, the Thunderbird that shows up. And this is where the rape and the murder happens. All right. So as you can see, there's nothing that Eric Draven could have done, not being a gun owner and uh, not being in his nature to kill. And so the crow appears, Eric Draven is shot in the head, uh, Shelly is raped for a while, then her head stomped in and she's shot, and, she's, and then Fun Boy rapes her some more because again, he doesn't care, that's how empty and hollow he is. And there's the rain and the moon that comes back. We found out here Eric Draven is actually dead. So he is a ghost. And there's the corpse bride again. All right. And finally, the end. And we have this, uh, you know, there's a, the movie said that Eric Draven is a musician. They just invented that from the movie. Eric Draven probably was a mechanic uh, like James of Barr because, he, you know, that's what we have here. This is an interesting scene. You know, it's kind of like, making love under the Christmas, you know, lights. And, you know, uh, it's one of the new scenes. And on the opposing page there, that's the cemetery. So it's foreshadowing when he finally gets all his revenge and passes on. So here we're going to have, you know, gearing up for war. You know, again, him dancing like Shelley. It's becoming more labored and painful. And then the catharsis of finally moving on, burning down the house. Um, he goes to see Sherry. And this is the part where he makes sure, you know, he checks on her one last time and says goodbye and makes sure that the officer is going to be there to, uh, is going to be informed about her. Um, the cat goes to Captain Hook, <laughs> kind of a funny name, or Sergeant Hook. Um, and we find out that here in the bottom left, that if you read that letter closely, you'll see that, uh, Professor Albrecht, uh, I mean, uh, Professor, <laughs> Officer Albrecht is going to probably take in Sherry um, there. 
So now we have the death scene here of Fun Boy, which is a really interesting conversation full of references to Paradise Lost, John Milton, the River Leth, which is the river you go through uh, as you go to the underworld in Greek mythology uh, that washes you of your memories. Um, Eric Draven carves a crown of thorn on his chest. Um, again, kind of, you know, the way Jesus had a crown of thorn on his, you know, the, it's interesting because the pain that's been thrust upon Eric Draven wasn't willing the way that Jesus was willing to be crucified. But Eric Draven puts a crown of thorn on himself to symbolize how it was placed, this pain was on him against his will, whereas Jesus has a crown of thorn put on him against his will. So it's really interesting inversion of these ideas, but at the same time, they're similar. Uh, but all of this discussion here, if you look up all these you know, references to religion and literature and music, they all have to deal about the idea of um, you know, religious philosophy and, and sin and fate and forgiveness and choice. And you know, this guy just is simply being empty piece of crap. Um, this I Know Why Jesus Wept, Mother Effer, is interesting because it can be interpreted two ways. Um, I Know Why Jesus Wept is in, you know, I feel sorry for all these sinners. I wish I could save them. Or uh, Jesus wept because possibly he realized that, no matter, you know, he sacrificed himself for a bunch of a-holes who weren't going to get right. Um, it's kind of interesting. Um, Eric Draven forgives this guy here. There's more religious reference and iconography. If you'll notice, Eric Draven on the bottom left-hand corner panel seems to be on the cross in that shadow. And next, as he lets this guy live who didn't want to be involved, um, he's almost praying at that shadow. All right, this next part, look, I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to let it run while I talk. But basically, there's a whole lot of killing, a whole lot of religious reference, a whole lot of literary illusion, a whole lot of song illusion, each one that can be Googled and researched. Um, but, you know, it's all, this is kind of the action scene. Besides the dialogue and the, 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 the cats and the Christ imagery, there's not a whole lot to analyze. Um, I will say, though, if Ivy Kendrick is listening, uh, the, one of the license plates on one of the cars in this scene says Godzilla, man. That's for you. Army of cats, attack. Okay. We have the final T-Bird death scene here, which seemed a little anticlimactic to me, but what is important is what comes next. This scene. When you're in the forest in literature, you're always in danger of losing your soul, and you're lost, and you're surrounded by bad stuff, and there's the idea of the crossroads and making a choice. That's what we have here. Now, James O'Barr wrote this like 20-something years after the original because what happened was he figured out that the drunk driver that killed his girlfriend wasn't his fault. He blamed himself because his girlfriend was coming to see him and his insurance had lapsed and he didn't want to drive. So if he wouldn't let his insurance lapse, she wouldn't have been coming and he, she wouldn't have got killed. And he finally gets rid of that idea and forgives himself. He gets rid of his own blame, self-blame, self-shame, I mean shame, self-guilt, all that stuff, anger. And Eric does also symbolically here by killing the horse. And so now the horse no longer represents Shelley, it represents Eric Draven. His blame, his innocence, his guilt, his shame, all that pain, all that suffering, he has to symbolically kill it and let it go. And once he does, he can be reunited with Shelley, the corpse, bride, the spirit that's moved on. And again, you have the train and death there, the idea of moving on, change. Um, and then we have the end. We have a door up there with a light behind it symbolizing moving on. We have Eric and Shelley's graves. We have the word Passover. We have a cemetery with angels and crosses. And we actually get to see the black-haired Shelley, meaning dead Shelley, not live Shelley, blonde on the left. Um, but the black-haired Shelley, now the corpse bride, they are reunited. And at the top of the page, the, cor the crow leaves as he came. And, that, and the gun is laid to rest. It's all over. 
that black page right there was the part about crows and these colored pages coming up are the original uh, covers when this comic was I think six or seven issues or eight or nine issues